Since its founding in 1941, the publication then known as Craft Horizons and now American Craft has been the principal investigator, promoter, and mirror of contemporary craft in the United States. American Craft Magazine is thriving. In 2010, there were 21,000 ACC member subscribers. There are now more than 30,000. New sand sales are up 40% in the last year. And the magazine is a finalist for two new national awards for editorial excellence and design, adding to the almost 20 awards the publication has won in recent years. The nascent years of Studio Craft found few outlets for interpretation, and in an era without the ubiquity of information at one's fingertips, sources such as Craft Horizons played many diverse roles in this community. With generous support from the National Endowment for the Arts, the first 25 years of Craft Horizons has been digitized, making craft history widely available for the first time. Now, the ability for scholars, artists, and enthusiasts to access the wide span of this seminal publication will provide new insight into the multiplicity of where we've been, where we are, and where we might be going. Originally shared at SOFA Chicago in 2013, American Craft Editor-in-Chief Monica Moses and Council Librarian Jessica Chiquette share American Craft's early years, today's approach, and a vision for the future of this publication. I'm going to start by giving you a whirlwind tour of the history of the magazine. The magazine began in 1941 as an unnamed mimeograph newsletter. The United States was on the verge of war and just emerging from years of economic depression. So what you find in those earliest issues are some consistent themes around craftspeople making a living, around patriotism, and on, around the standing of the United States in the world. A key moment in the history of the magazine came in 1959 with the arrival of a new editor, Rose Slivka. Slivka came to her role just as a craft movement was coalescing in the United States, and the content of the issues that Slivka edited, much of which was very provocative, was aimed very much at a community of makers. Another watershed year was 1979, when the magazine got not only a new editor, Lois Moran, but also a new name. It went from being Craft Horizons to being American Craft. Uh, Lois Moran shifted the focus of the magazine away from craft processes and began to address a broader audience beyond the community of makers. As it turns out, Moran was one of the longest running American magazine editors in history. You have to fast forward 26 years, 27 years actually, before you get another new editor, and that was Andrew Wagner, who came from Dwell Magazine and ushered in a dramatic redesign of the magazine. Uh, Wagner was interested in indie craft and an in international craft, and under his leadership, the magazine launched a new website, AmericanCraftMag.org, which continues today as part of the larger CraftCouncil.org website. My tenure as editor-in-chief began in 2010. Today, our goal is to honor the legacy of the 20th century studio craft movement, but just as important, we want the magazine to be interesting and relevant to people who may not know that legacy. Today, the printed edition is very important, but just as important is the, our, our digital channels. Uh, the website, social media, video, those are important tools for us. This is our mission. And I'll direct your attention to the last sentence here. The magazine celebrates the age-old human impulse to make things by hand in order to communicate, learn, heal, and connect. In other words, we believe that craft is an, a timeless, universal, essential human inclination, and as such, should be put before the broadest possible audience. To that end, we believe in uh, writing that is concise, interesting, accessible, and we are unapologetically visual in our approach. So with that preview of today, let's turn to history and Jessica. So as Monica and I were kind of um, reflecting back on the history of the magazine um, and the council, we noticed that from the earliest installment of Craft Horizons um, to the most recent issue of American Craft, um, the magazine has continuously served in four different roles in its coverage of the field of craft. Um, these four roles, including the magazine as chronicler, as tastemaker, as convener, and as provocateur, um, really serve as the basis for our talk today. 
So starting off with the role of the magazine as chronicler, Craft Horizons from the 1940s through the 1970s served as the primary journal in the field to reference the contemporary decorative arts and crafts as they relate to important historical, economic, and cultural trends and events taking place throughout the mid-20th century. There are many examples of Craft Horizons as a chronicler, including the May and November 1942 editions, um, which featured a two-part article entitled Craftsmen in the War. This article explains how the ACC selected representatives to meet with U.S. government officials um, to see if exemptions could be allowed for metal spits, fiber artists, and others to gain access to bulk materials to continue their livelihood during World War II. Although the request was denied, the two-part article offers advice to practicing artists on how to continue making in a time of strict rationing and how to really utilize their skills to contribute to the war effort. In addition to championing artists, the magazine was a trailblazer um, when it came to promoting artistic activities um, abroad by chronicling the first showing of American crafts in an international arena. Uh, on the screen, you see an article from 1958 on US crafts being shown at the American Pavilion of the Brussels World's Fair. Um, this was the first time American craft objects were shown to an international audience. It was also the first time craft um, has been given attention at an event as monumental and well attended as the World's Fair. Likewise, economic, economics, both in the US and abroad, was a major focus for the magazine. Um, for example, you see on the screen an article examining um, the state of um, the marketplace in the US, the crafts marketplace in the US, um, and another raising the question of whether or not crafts um, are going extinct in Asia. Uh, information such as this can be used by researchers to really chronicle the growth and influence of crafts in the marketplace over time. Another way Craft Horizons really um, documented the contemporary craft field was by publishing a calendar of events which they started doing in 1950. Um, as more exhibitions were starting to occur, especially one-man shows, uh, we see throughout the 1950s a shifting focus on mobilizing makers to educating them. In an age long before the internet, Craft Horizons served as the one and only place craftsmen in both urban and rural areas could gain information on um, exhibitions, like who was exhibiting where, um, and what, and what um, competitions were going on. Today, the Craftsman's Calendar gives us a complete record of ex exhibitions, conferences, and workshops taking place um, throughout uh, contemporary craft history, um, even events where no catalogs or brochures or any sort of record really exists, um, including shows that happened at galleries that may not um, be operating anymore. Um, another interesting uh, thing to note in the 1950s is the integration of fine art and contemporary graphic design into the magazine, um, especially on the covers. A series of art directors hired um, for the magazine with backgrounds in abstract art uh, including Bob Cato, who went on to design many famous record album covers as the creative director for Columbia Records, um, led to the use of colorful graphics alongside craft objects on these covers, um, as well as um, images uh, that were loaned from other museums and galleries, um, such as this shown here on the screen um, with the stencil cut by, um, which many will recognize, by Spanish painter Juan Moreau. Um, which was loaned to Craft Horizons by the Perspectives Gallery in New York. In this regard, Craft Horizons is a fantastic reference um, for recounting mid-century trends in graphic design. So in addition to the calendar, Craft Horizons also provided a more in-depth documentation of conferences, exhibitions, and happenings um, through feature articles. Some of the key examples of this type of frontline reporting include the first national exhibition of craftsmen entitled Designer Craftsman USA at the Brooklyn Museum in 1953, the historic American pottery tour made by English potter Bernard Leach and Japanese potter Shoji Hamada in the early 1950s. Um, while in our archives we have a handful of photographs and proceedings from events like these and also from the first national conference of craftsmen at Asilomar in 1957, um, Craft Horizons really provides um, a very accurate and detailed first-person account of the most important and influential activities that took place at these gatherings, all of which included influential movers and shakers of the time, including Charles Eames, uh, Jack Lenore Larson, and Toshiko Takezu. After the war, Craft Horizons made a surprisingly global investigation into craft. Uh, stories featured as early as the mid-1940s covered ceramics in Puerto Rico, the industrial impact of crafts in China, um, Czech glassmakers, and the influence of decorative arts in Scandinavia. 
The magazine also covered the creation and activities of the World Crafts Council, starting with the 12-page spread in 1964. Um, again, at this time, the magazine was providing readers with a glimpse of craft practices abroad, while today we use these materials to examine parallel activities um, among countries uh, and also outside influences that might have impacted the development of American styles and tastes. We still publish a calendar of events in the magazine, but today there are so many exhibitions, workshops, conferences, and other events that what we publish in the print edition is a tiny sliver of what's happening in the world. Uh, what we do in the print edition is aim for a mix of locales and mediums, but thank heaven for the infinite space of the internet because that's where our more comprehensive calendar listings reside. And it's one of the most visited places on our website. We even have a self-serve form that allows event organizers to post their own events. Another way we serve as chronicler is by uh, marking the key milestones in the field. For example, the first uh, museum exhibition and collection of polymer objects, which happened in 2011 at the Racine Art Museum, in which we covered with an eight-page feature. And we track trends, for example, the rise of auctions devoted to craft in the United States, which we covered with a 10-page feature in our recent August-September issue. Uh, it was interesting that as we uh, prepared this story and were ready to go to press with it, we learned that a Ruth Asawa piece had uh, fetched $1.4 million at auction, uh, four times the highest estimate, breaking all kinds of records, and we had just enough time to wedge that into the story. Probably the most intensive bit of chronicling we've done in recent years was for our 17-page comprehensive craft timeline that we published in 2011 as part of our 70th anniversary. Uh, we had a number of categories that we tracked in this timeline. All of the mediums, the main craft mediums, clay, fiber, wood, metal, glass, plus paper. And we also covered uh, museums and institutions, uh, craft and mainstream culture, and cultural influences on the field of craft. At the end, we had 232 entries, scores of images, all of which required weeks upon weeks of research, writing, editing, and fact checking. At one point, I think we had three full-time fact checkers on the story. Here's the 1960s spread from that story. Uh, it includes the Mad Potter of Biloxi, the impact of mod fashion on craft, and Jackie Kennedy leading a televised tour of decorative arts at the White House. Here's the 2000s spread, which includes G's Ben Quilts, the rise of Ken Price, the launch of Etsy, Project Runway, and the publication of the first textbook devoted to studio crafts. So looking at the role of Tastemaker, um, Craft Horizons really strived um, to provide aesthetic guidance to artists um, by demonstrating a fluid relationship between craft and um, interior design, craft and art, and craft and architecture. Um, some of the ways that this was accomplished was by having leaders in these um, various fields writing articles. Um, on the screen, uh, you'll see some examples. You, we have Annie Albers. Um, a weaver who is, has written an article on hand weaving for modern interiors, the Smiths Discover Interior Design, um, which is very much like today's Crafted Lives um, section in an American craft magazine. Um, and we have a column that started from the very beginning of the magazine, actually from the very first issue entitled Workshop, um, wherein artists and manufacturers really uh, provide instruction on certain modern and up and coming um, tools and techniques, um, such as on the screen, the examples of um, the building an electric kiln and um, electroforming metals. When I was looking for articles to highlight uh, Craft Horizons in the role of tastemaker, it was really hard to resist um, including this very literal uh, issue from February 1944 where taste was the theme. Uh, again, here on the screen, you have two articles written by very different authors um, from outside the crafts field. Um, John D. Morse, the editor of the Magazine of Art uh, and an employee at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, and Guy Gaylor Clark, who was dean of um, the Cooper Union Art School, along with Van de Troo from Parsons School of Design. Um, in the first article uh, on the left, uh, Morse provides a rather philosophical look at um, how mid-century taste 
or rather what he saw as um, what influences mid-century taste, including the colors, lines, um, and materials that make something tasteful, uh, differs from that of the Victorian age. Um, and then Clark and, Tr and Tro examine actual objects in an exhibition. So they go into an exhibition, look at the objects, and explain what subjective characteristics um, make them tasteful. So Craft Horizons abounds um, with like, articles such as these providing discerning tips um, for the artist reader uh, and, a and a detailed account of mid-century trends um, and preferences for us today. So the magazine was also a tastemaker um, in its mission to increase standards in the field. This largely came about with the hiring of Rose Slivka, who, as Monica mentioned earlier, um, really set about to um, elevate craft to the level of fine art. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, we start, start seeing some more reflection on the field and a focus on those artists um, and shops that were innovating, um, including from these examples on the screen, um, experimental jewelry in Northern California, um, Shop One, a very successful retail space um, in Rochester, New York, um, that was actually founded by three craftspeople, uh, and the woodworker Sam Maloof. And actually, this uh, article on Maloof in the center of the spread um, was published just three years into his career. Um, and this is just one of many examples of artists who um, were discovered early on by Craft Horizons and went on to be featured over and over in the magazine and eventually end up as these very um, highly respected masters of their media. And you'll see the Designer Craftsman USA article, um, which is one of the first examples from the magazine of true criticism um, in the field of craft. Designer Craftsman USA 1960 was only the second competition um, to take place, the first being um, the competition I mentioned earlier at the Brooklyn Museum, Designer Craftsman 1953. Uh, David Campbell, who was um, an architect and then president of the American Craft Council, um, wrote this um, scathing yet solic solicitous review of the competition. In this way, the ACC often used the magazine as an outlet to call attention to areas um, like the juring methods, um, in need of responsiveness from the organization itself. Today, artist profiles are really our bread and butter. We get a lot of feedback from readers who tell us that they uh, enjoy reading about emerging artists, established artists, um, artists who've switched gears, artists who've struggled, artists who've triumphed. triumphed. Uh, those stories seem to really resonate with our readers. And we have the um, pleasure, really, of exposing artists to our broad audience, which is about 30,000 subscribers, and we estimate about more than 90,000 readers, uh, exposing that broad audience to various readers, some of whom are not widely known. For example, Hee Chan Kim is somebody we covered in 2011 before he was widely known. In fact, we had trouble actually finding his contact information. Since that time, however, in fact, just this past September, he took home the grand prize at the big International Craft Biennial in South Korea, besting uh, 1,200 artists from 55 countries, and he's now very much uh, a figure on the world stage. Similarly, we covered Myung Urso when she had been a jewelry maker for just four years. Uh, and now she's represented by a slew of galleries and is very much a force in contemporary art jewelry. Tova Lund is somebody we covered in our, uh, on our radar department, which looks at emerging artists. After Lund had just finished her first street fair, uh, now her work has been represented in a book, in other magazines, and she has gallery representation. Audrey Roselek is a ceramist who we covered when she had been doing her work for just three years. Uh, I checked in on, on her progress recently, and in 2013 alone, she's been in six exhibitions and was one of a handful of ceramists, uh, functional potters actually, included in the Ensica Biennial. And then finally, uh, we got to play tastemaker in the case of Jennifer Merchant, who's a young jewelry maker who uses acrylic and magazine pages in her work. Um, Merchant uh, actually got a call from a gallery owner in New York on the basis of our story uh, asking to represent her. So in all of these cases, we take pleasure in um, exposing artists to a broader audience 
and watching them make progress after that. It's, it's a great uh, source of gratification for us. The third role that we identified was um, the magazine as convener. And by convener, what we mean is um, convening in a sense that we're bringing people together with other people, um, professionals, professionals, artists with artists, um, and we're also bringing people together with new ideas. Um, so to start, in the 1940s, uh, articles such as What Makes a Successful Craftsman, um, Where Does Your Money Go, and uh, This Is What Decorators Want, <laughs> appeared regularly in an effort to kind of professionalize um, the craft force um, and set standards and certainly get makers from divergent places on the same page um, ac across the country. Frances Corot, who just happened to be the daughter of um, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, wrote a regular column in, in Craft Horizons entitled Prevailing Winds, um, in which she attempted to kind of demystify um, the experience of retailing, wholesaling, um, and styling one's wares. These articles, in addition to the workshop columns that I mentioned earlier, um, were very much focused on educating craftsmen on um, how to do and how to be. In a conversation I once had with renowned um, glassmaker uh, Joel Philip Myers, he credited information obtained from Craft Horizons um, with his decision to set up a studio-based approach to glass blowing um, in a time when he was working in, in a very rural area of West Virginia um, for the Blanco Glass Company. So in 1950, Craft Horizons began publishing an advertising section um, wherein manufacturers of equipment and tools, um, as well as schools promoting workshops and degrees, uh, could let readers know about their products and services. At the same time, a craftsman's marketplace um, was created where an artist themselves could sell their wares and sell their catalogs um, and really put wanted ads for equipment and tools. Uh, additionally, a long running column at the front of Craft Horizons called Counter Cues, which um, the, is essentially the equivalent of today's goods section of American Craft. Um, highlighted affordable, functional objects that were for sale across the U.S. Um, this section of the magazine was so successful that in a 1960s letter to the editor, a representative from Herman Miller um, wrote that 50% of all mail order sales um, for that company uh, during the holiday season were for m objects that had been featured in this um, shopper section of the magazine. In these ways, Craft Horizons um, was matching artists with tools, um, artists with artists, artists with buyers, um, long before the rise in popularization of um, craft shows and galleries, or even something like Etsy. Um, finally, Craft Horizons, um, through its publishing of guild notes, uh, exhibition reviews, and craft activities, was able to keep makers abreast of developments um, and happenings, not solely among the innovators, um, who were often the, in the featured features part of the magazine, um, but also the local historical society, a regional knitting club, or a city woodworkers league. Um, Craft Horizons inspired craftspeople um, from even the most remote areas of the United States or e with even the basic skills to action. Uh, there was a, sin a sincere sense of community uh, in the section of the magazines and artists really looked to, um, to what others were doing and found lines of communication and means of collaboration um, with the support of Craft Horizons. Today there are a number of items in the front of the magazine that serve a convening function. Interviews with gallery owners and newsmakers, show previews, book reviews, that sort of thing. But we're also conveners in a different sense in that we bring together contributors and um, uh, multiple sources for all of the more extensive stories that we do. I mentioned our 17-page uh, timeline a few slides ago. That timeline relied on 16 contributors from all across the country to suggest items that ought to be included. In our current issue, our, the jewelry issue, we have a 16-page page feature that surveys um, contemporary jewelry artists, and that relies on contributors. Um, we asked nine people mostly curators and writers with a special expertise in contemporary art jewelry to suggest artists whom we ought to cover. And in general, we really like the idea of asking contributors to help us shape our coverage. Here's a spread from that jewelry feature. We uh, included Q&As with uh, jewelry artists. 
Another way that we serve as a convener is that we um, try to address some of the questions that have arisen in the field, either directly from readers or just questions that we sort of sense in the air. Um, Glenn Adamson, the new director of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, is somebody who's written for us extensively. Here he is in the magazine uh, addressing the question of whether the popular understanding of the word craft is a problem for the, stu the field of studio craft. And finally, we serve as convener in that we try to bring people together around the most sophisticated work being done in the field. Um, we do this primarily through our biennial mastery issue, highlighting the new inductees of the uh, American Craft Council College of Fellows. Uh, our, in our 2012 mastery issue, we included a 24-page feature on the new fellows, and we had supplementary videos online. Here is a spread on the gold medalist Stephen Destabler from that feature. So that is the convening function, and now we're gonna talk about the role of provocateur. So Craft Horizons really served as a provocateur in three different ways throughout its history. Um, first was with the hiring of Rose Livka um, and subsequent editorial staff who were editorially provocative. Um, Slivka can really be credited with introducing um, art criticism in, th in theory um, to Craft Horizons. The most inf infamous example of this is Slivka's 1961 article, The New Ceramic Presence. Um, in this piece, which reads more um, like a critical scholarly essay than a magazine feature, um, she calls for a new direction in craft uh, more in line with what was happening in the abstract art world. Um, her argument was that craft, um, particularly ceramics, um, shouldn't be bound by tradition, but should rather embrace uh, the culture and attitudes of contemporary times. Her core example in this piece, and really throughout many of her later writings, um, was ceramist Peter Volkos. This article caused a tremendous uproar in the crafts community. Um, two issues later, the magazine published responses. Actually, two issues later and beyond, I mean, it, the, the responses kept rolling in, um, both pro and con, um, from such greats as woodworker Wharton Escherich, um, who really embraced uh, Slivka's um, sentiments um, and encouraged her to continue um, looking at craft um, from this perspective, uh, to Marguerite Wil Wildenhain and Warren McKenzie, um, both of whom chastised Slivka's dismissal of functional work. Um, Marguerite Wildenhain's response um, to the piece uh, was particularly salty. Uh, she alters the famous Latin um, Marcus Tilius Cicero quote um, from the Catiline orations, um, you know, how long, oh Catiline, will you abuse our patients? To say, how long, Rose Slivka, will you test our patients? So the second type of provocateur featured in Craft Horizons was the artist contributor, of which there were many in the magazine's 38 year run. Um, I'll, I've highlighted two examples here on the screen. Uh, one is of course the ever vocal Peter Volkos, um, who caused controversy with statements he made in a recap of um, a, a recap of his experience during an, um, the Miami Annual in 1957. Um, Volko says, with the exception of about 10 objects, the Miami exhibition was, in, as most ceramic shows go, dull, unimaginative, and uninspired. He goes on to say that crafts are too clicky and closed off from the visual arts which kind of his sentiment really does mirror the sentiment of Rose Slivka. Um, it is worth noting, and, and this is where the entertaining provocative part comes in, that in a letter to the editor um, published in the following issue, Volkos is accused by um, a colleague in the field of awarding the top prizes at this Miami annual competition to his own students. Um, a back and forth in the, in the, published in the magazine um, ensues that is certainly worth a read. A second example is a critical reflection um, by fiber artist Dorian Zakai on her experience during a 1964 fiber clay and metal show. Uh, in this derisive review, Zakai rallied against the current mode of jurying exhibitions, saying, when juries cooperate, it all ends up looking like mashed potatoes. And what she was referring to was, um, during this exhibition, um, there were a lot of kind of experimental um, uh, uh, abstract 
works being um, presented and, and where they just didn't, where they weren't quite sure how they fit into the different roles of fiber, clay, and metal. And so were therefore, you know, many objects were rejected that maybe should have been accepted. Zakai goes on to use the example of a fake piece of jewelry um, that was submitted to the competition um, that was actually made of junk wire, a cheesy toy sheriff's badge um, for a child, a cheap cameo and some rocks, um, which was submitted and actually given an award and um, humorously enough featured, the image of the jewelry piece was actually featured in Craft Horizons. I read later in the book Makers by Janet Koplos and Bruce Metcalf um, that this junky piece of jewelry was submitted by another juror as a joke. Anyway, Zakai's review really um, gave way to a landslide of letters debating the difference between art and craft, um, commentary that really helped establish uh, more refined juring standards uh, and led to a better understanding of experimental work. So the third and final type of provocation found in Craft Horizons um, really came from the counterculture movements of the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, Craft Horizons began to follow new trends and styles of the time, especially in ceramics. Um, if you think of the funk ceramics of um, Bob Arneson and, and da um, David Gahuli and fiber, um, such as the very like freeform um, experimental weavings of um, Ed Rossback and Catherine um, Westfall. Um, much to the chagrin of, traditional, of the more traditional readers and even ACC founder Eileen Osborne Webb, um, who, who is said to have kind of rolled her eyes a bit at some of these more contemporary trends. Here on the screen, we have an article on the new object makers, including contemporary pop artist Richard Archweger and Klaus Oldenburg, um, as well as Lenora Tani, whose caption on the front page of her article reads, Weavers on juries tend to reject my work. Painters on juries have tended to like it. Um, there was also a focus on youth in the magazine during this time um, with greater consideration and therefore um, magazine space given to the up and coming artists, um, especially those competing in the ACC's Young Americans competition, um, which was a, an exhibition and competition for artists under the age of 30. Speaking of provocative, <clears throat> this 2009 cover probably generated more buzz than any other in the magazine's history. If there's been a more controversial cover, I don't know about it. Um, this in-your-face representation of jewelry maker Lauren Coleman's work was apparently not everyone's cup of tea, and when I started my job in 2010, I was still hearing about it. We have a section in the magazine called Ideas That is Frequently Provocative. Uh, here is an, a book excerpt that puts forward a model of museums that is vastly different from the museums than you and I are familiar with. And we learned through social media that a number of curators found this quite interesting. Uh, we also published a Q&A with a scholar and ceramics dealer Garth Clark who argued that it's not realistic for most craftspeople to make a living working by themselves and that in addition to being craftspeople, they should try to be designers. Uh, even though this story ran more than a year ago, I'm still getting feedback on it. I think I got an email about it a couple of weeks ago. Finally, we published an interview with Michael Petrie, the author of The Art of Not Making, which documents the practice of conceptual artists using craftspeople to realize their works. For example, uh, when Kiki Smith wants to use glass in her work, she doesn't know how to blow glass, so she calls on a craftsperson to do that work for her. And we knew that, the, uh, that our direct questioning about the fact that craftspeople are generally not credited for the work that they do for conceptual artists might ruffle some feathers. We knew that homing in on the sort of conceptual artist discounting of skill and the role of material knowledge might rub people the wrong way, but we thought it was important to highlight those issues for our readers. And in general, we find the role of provocateur a very valuable one. So again, um, kind of looking back, um, really considering why, so why are both Craft Horizons and American Craft important today especially among a sea of other publications that have come about over the past 70 years. Um, we've highlighted the four roles, and just as a quick review, you know, the magazine is Chronicler. The magazine is one of the only publications to provide a concrete historical record of activities um, critical to the de development of the contemporary craft field. The magazine uses history, economics, and cultural trends to put craft in context. 
As Tastemaker, many artists featured in the magazine early on in their career have come full circle. Um, the editorial staff of the past and present work hard to identify unique and innovative work. Um, the magazine may not please everyone, um, as you heard today in our stories about Marguerite Wildenhain and um, the gold-tongued Lauren Coleman. Um, however, staff strive to maintain not only strict journalistic standards, but also to elevate conversation, education, and creative excellence within the field at large. So if all this background information on Craft Horizons and American Craft has piqued your interest and inspired you to seek out these issues, you're really in luck. Uh, much of the content from the past five years of American Craft can be found on our website, along with um, full text issues of the first 25 years of Craft Horizons. The Craft Horizons digitization project came about with the help of funding um, from the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and has been something that we recently launched in the fall of 2013. Um, now online through our ACC, digital libra ACC Library Digital Collections, you can see issues of Craft Horizons from 1941 to 1965, um, fully accessible and free online. Other content available um, through the ACC Library Digital Collections includes historical photographs, um, proceedings and newsletters from the 1950s all the way through the 1990s, as well as exhibition catalogs and photographs from the Museum of Contemporary Crafts in New York City, um, which was really the first major museum um, to focus on collecting, craft, collecting and exhibiting craft. Um, we also have select photographs of artists and objects um, collected from the artists themselves, available online as part of our virtual artists file collection. Jessica and I want to thank you for listening, and we hope you'll keep reading.